Hi. So I'm assuming that a lot of the people who are here are perhaps joined during the COVID shutdown and have been patiently waiting to get out with their telescopes. And uh, I'm speaking at least one person's language here and don't really know where to go or how to get started. Hi. Oh, is that David Winstrom? can't drink and observe at the same time. <laughs> that is so true. Actually, it is very true that uh, one of the kind of, I don't know, part of the culture of uh, being an amateur astronomer trying to do field work is that you don't drink and you don't smoke. And the reason you don't drink is you don't want to mess up your eyes. Alcohol affects your eyes. And also, you don't want to be stumbling around in the dark uh, among very expensive equipment. Um, and then you don't smoke, of course, just because it stinks. <laughs> so should I get started? Hi, Joe. Hi, Wes. Wow, I was <laughs> expecting either of you here because you've done a lot of... And Allison, is that uh, my Allison? So... So anyway, um, I wanted to talk a little bit because I think this is the number one question that comes across my desk is generally from new members. And their question is basically, where can I go observing? And uh, they always list what they're looking for. And I can tell you what everybody is looking for. We're looking for a place that is mm, 30 minutes drive from our home. And that when you get there, there is no light pollution from the nearby metropolitan area. You can drive in uh, on flat ground and there's flat grass and you can park your car right there on the grass and then you can lo uh, unload your car, it's set up and do your nights observing. And there's a nice clean bathroom within a few walking feet from where you are. And then you come back and pack up your car and nobody else has gotten there all night long because <laughs> nobody else knows about this. So nobody drives in with their headlights on. Well, guess what? That doesn't exist. If that, if that were in existence, please let me know about it, okay? So what we find is we have to kind of weigh and measure the goods and bads of every place you want to go observing. And I would say that pretty much every location is going to be 50% goods and 50% bads. And you just have to decide which ones you're willing to put up with. The goods are its accessibility from Portland. Uh, but the payoff for that is the closer to Portland, the more light pollution. If you really want to get out and see some truly dark skies, you're going to have to drive. That's just, that's, that's the reality. Um, other kinds of uh, things that, you know, other observers want to know about is things like, are there mosquitoes? <laughs> are there coyotes? Mm -hmm. um, sagebrush? How rocky is it? Um, are there trees blocking the way? Is there a bright farmer's light across the road? Um, so... Uh, there's always going to be something that somebody doesn't like. There's no such thing as a perfect place. But I thought that I would talk to you about a few places that we use fairly often. And the most important criterion is that they're not too far from Portland. And the number one place, of course, is Stubb Stewart State Park out near Vernonia. And that park was actually designed by the city or by the state of Oregon with us, with our club. They, um, they worked with us and we worked with them to create that hilltop area that was part of the kind of, I don't know what the park bureaucratic language is, but sort of like the, the public use or the public good that would come out of creating this park is that there would be a place to observe. So some goods about Stubb Stewart. Well, it's close. And it's more or less free. You do have to part pay a uh, $5 parking fee. And there's a, a little sort of machine there, like a parking machine. You put your money in. 
and you need a stargazer permit. And that stargazer permit is on um, the state parks website. And it's also on our forum in more than one place. So if you go to the forum and you go to the search and you search stargazer permit, you'll find two or three conversations that have it. If you can't find it, send me an email. I'll send you the link. Um, they do that and they want you to put it on the dashboard of your car uh, so that if the ranger has to go up there and start kicking people out of the park for staying there overnight because that's a day use area, they'll see your stargazer permit and allow you to stay in. Um, we have had special permission from the park during the COVID shutdown to go up there. We do not advertise that. We don't announce it on the forum. We, I mean, on the uh, on our Facebook page, we don't put it on the regular part of our website. We only put it in the forum. But apparently, you know, you put something on the internet, people seem to find out about it. So apparently the word has gotten out. Um, and I also think that as, as the COVID shutdown opens up more, there's going to be more people up there. I heard complaints about Friday and Saturday night, this last Friday and Saturday night, um, about how much traffic there was up there. And this is important because that's one of the major drawbacks of Stubb Stewart is it's right on a road where people drive back and forth. It's really very annoying. It can also be windy up there and it can get damp in the middle of the, of the night, about two o'clock in the morning, it just boom, the dew just comes out of the air and just settles on your telescope and your jacket and <laughs> your table. <laughs> so uh, it has goods and bads. One good about it for us is that you can go up any night. And there are a number of people in the club who live on the west side and they find that they can look out the window and say, oh, it's looking kind of nice. It's a Tuesday night. I can go up to Stubb and spend it two or three hours and they're likely to run into another person from the club up there. Uh, so that's been kind of our go-to location. And it will probably, in spite of its uh, drawbacks, continue to be a go-to location. So if you're looking for a place that um, you can get to on any night of the week and uh, it's more uh, uh, pretty cheap and you're and it has a nice grassy field and a nice bathroom <laughs> with red lights in it <laughs> and picnic tables, uh, there's a lot of good things about it. Uh, but unfortunately, lots of other people know about it. <clears throat> so um, we do have a problem with headlights. And sometimes the members of the public just sort of wandering through and wanting to know what we're doing and wanting us to show them everything on their telescopes and you don't get your own observing time because you're too busy taking care of these people who come through. We also have an arrangement with Rooster Rock State Park on the other side of the, of the city. And we did that on purpose. We would have on nights that we had a great big public star party that was really an OMSI star party that RCA would provide the telescopes for, we'd have half of it at Stubb Stewart and half at Rooster Rock. And we did that because Portland has gotten to be such a major metropolitan area that nobody wants to drive all the way across the footprint of the city. And so we set up an east and west locations. Stubb was able to stay open and keep that open for us. Rooster Rock shut it basically shut us out. Um, they were kind of shut out. Rooster Rock has now become more or less a parking lot for tour buses that now take people up to Multnomah Falls. And um, so we can't, we never had permission to just go out there in any night you want to. Uh, but it has some, it has some advantages. When we have events at Rooster Rock, which may come back in 2022, uh, it's fairly close to the east side of the city. Um, the, the lights from the traffic are not nearly so bad because the park is set off from uh, the, the Gorge Highway enough that those lights aren't, you know, just 
uh, whizzing past you all the time. But there is a major glow from the city. And also, you're right next to the Columbia River. So as the day gets cooler, you get this huge evapotranspiration off the river, and it lands on your <laughs> telescope and on your jacket and on your table. It gets very, very damp there sometimes. Uh, but, uh, you know, for a place that's close to Portland, it's not too bad. This is not a place that you can just sort of show up. Two places where you probably can are snow parks. One of them is the White River Snow Park. And we have actually had uh, official RCA Club star parties at the White River Snow Park. It's not too far from Portland. It's uh, on the, on the uh, east side. It's about, what, 35 miles or so. Um, easy to get to. It can be a little confusing because they're kind of like two White River things. One of them is off of 26 and one of them is off Highway 35. And you have to make sure you're getting to the right one. It's the snow park. And I believe it's, it's the one where you know, you go over Mount Hood and you pass government camp and you go past that a little bit and then there's a split. And one of them will take you off to Maupin and the other one will take you down to Bend, right? You want to take that one. Wow. Okay, so you get to White River Snow Park. It's a huge parking lot, huge. So it's paved, yay, you can set up. Um, <laughs> the bathrooms there are horrible. They're beyond horrible. They were so bad that when we had our own events there, we would rent our own porta potties and take them up there. And uh, uh, but if you just go up on your own, uh, you're just going to have to deal with it. That's the that's the reality. The the public bathroom up there is not very well maintained. That's a, a way to put it. So if you have a an RV or a little trailer, is something that could be a good spot for you. Um, also, because it's a public parking area. You never know who's going to drive in. Well, I'll tell you who's going to drive in. It's truckers. And it's truckers who need to drive in, stop, use the restroom, get back <laughs> in their truck and leave. And so they have these big white lights that come out and then, but they don't bother you. You know, I was there one time by myself and I was all worried about, you know, being alone and getting coshed on the head and who knows what. But actually, uh, several truckers came in, but the place is so big that I was way off, kind of in a corner where they, I don't think they even realized I was there. They would come in and use the bathroom and leave. But during the summers, also, especially over holiday weekends, we were there, I think, on a Labor Day weekend or something. Lots of public up there. Um, people kept saying to us, is there anything special going on tonight? Where are you guys out of here? <laughs> so we just say, no, we're just out here to observe. And of course, there's no place nearby for eating. So you have to get in your vehicle and go back up to government camp uh, to get something to eat if you're going to spend the night there. But I like White River Snow Park uh, because I live near Milwaukee and it's pretty easy for me to get on 212 or 213 and pick up 26 and just get out there fairly. I can get there like in an hour and a quarter. And I like how big it is. It's huge. So you have lots of choice about where you can set yourself up. Uh, hopefully not to be bothered by other, um, other people driving in. There's another one, Trout Lake Snow Park. Actually, that one's called Flat Top. Flat Top Snow Park in Trout Lake, Washington. And we've had for years, our July RCA Club Star Party was at that, um, uh, was at that snow, uh, David from No Mino You. Uh, I'll, I'll answer that in a, in a second. I have to look it up on Google and make sure I have the right one. Um, so our, our traditional July RCA Club Star Party was at Flat Top Snow Park in Trout Lake. We don't have to have a permit to use it. Uh, the nice thing about these snow parks is that nobody uses them in the summer. Hardly anybody uses them in the summer. So, and the bathroom there is moderately better than the one at uh, White River. 
because it's not on a trucker route. And so you don't have all the big truckers, uh, big trucks coming in and somebody wanting to use them. Um, one, one bad thing about white uh, uh, flat top is that the trees are growing up. So every year the trees are getting a little bigger and it's kind of surrounded by trees. And so you're kind of at the point where you, you can observe from like 30 degrees above the horizon above, but you're not gonna get anything uh, uh, low to the ground. And both these parking lots have a lot of heat waves coming off the concrete at sunset. And I know people who won't observe on these flat paved areas because there's so much shimmering coming up and it takes so long for the concrete to cool off that to them it's not worth it. So again, everything is goods and bads, right? But there's no mosquitoes out there or coyotes. So an, another one that we use a lot is called Skyview Acres. Skyview Acres is, uh, we uh, call it SVA. So if you're on the forum and you see somebody talking about SVA, that's Skyview Acres. That's some private property. A guy named Phil Reed um, contacted us many years ago when he retired, at least 15 years ago, maybe more. And he uh, had been an engineer at Boeing and he bought this property out, uh, in, out just outside of Goldendale, Washington. And he wanted to kind of turn it into some kind of astronomical uh, destination of some sort. But he, uh, it never quite developed. I think he had bigger dreams than he had wallet for it. Um, so, and also he kind of liked to do everything. Uh, well, uh, anyway, it just didn't fly very well, but there is a, there's a big uh, container, like a shipping container on the property that he uses as his like puttering shop. So he's like a woodworker and a mechanical person and a fixer and a maker and a da 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 da. So he lives in Vancouver, but he goes out to the property fairly often and will stay out there for 10 days or so. Uh, just puttering around. He's also a ham radio, radio operator and the rest of the property is just empty. So you are welcome to come and set your telescopes up on basically a, a grass field, a very dry grass field. Um, and there's a ton of wind up there. And you notice that as you're driving up there to this property, there's all these windmills going around, right? Everybody knows that the gorge is this famous place on earth for wind power. So that's a little bit of a clue. <laughs> and there is one, one light up there that is really disturbing. And they tell us, yeah, <laughs> they tell us, uh, the owner of the property says, oh, just come and tell me, I'll turn it off. Uh, so you have to kind of ask her about that. He also put uh, about four kind of flat concrete pads on his property uh, that you can set up so you don't have to put your scope right on a bunch of dry grass. You can put it on one of these concrete pads. Um, I think that uh, the people who tend to use Skyview Acres are imagers. And most of them have their own RVs and they go up and they set up way on the end of the property away from those concrete pads because they're not very well located in terms of that one light bomb that comes off of that farm. Um, and he pays for and has a much neglected uh, porta potty on the property. So RCA for about six months of the year, we pay a local porta potty company to uh, have one on the property and to get it cleaned every week. And that's just something we spend our, our money on. So um, Phil has since his health has declined and he's no longer living in Vancouver. He's living with his children. The deal, he had a stroke a number of years ago. So the deal was that if we wanted to use a property, we would contact him and tell him we'd like to come out and he has a number of friends. There are people who kind of go out there regularly. And um, 
and we call him and say, Hey, I'd like to go out. And then would you like a ride? So then we would give him a ride out there and then somebody would, you know, get him back home again a week or two later. Uh, but we don't do that anymore because he's not uh, living close to the property. I don't know what's going to happen to that property. Should he pass away? Um, I'm, I don't know. In the back, way back here in the back of my brain, I think maybe RCA should buy that. But in the meantime, there's a private kind of collective or cooperative of some sort uh, very nearby that is buying some property in the same area near Goldendale. And they gave it a name that is very close to Skyview Acres. I think it's called Sky Village. They call themselves Sky Village. But you have to buy into that like for thousands of dollars. So um, that's not a place that we have told our new members that they can go. Okay, <clears throat> now moving farther away, the options are a little harder, um, but not impossible. Um, there is a lodge in Morrow, M-O-R-O, Oregon, uh, which is in what, Gilliam, Gilliam County or Sherman County, Gilliam County. Um, it is a little, just a little kind of ranch style house that somebody in Portland bought and was going to use as like a bed and breakfast or some kind of, uh, what's that thing they do on the internet where people stay? Uh, it's a big, it's a big thing on the internet. Airbnb. Airbnb, kind of something like that. I've, uh, there's one person in our club who goes up there fairly often and he will often put on the forum, he'll say, hey, everybody, I'm going up there this weekend. Would you like to share it with me? Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, an old a 70s style small ranch house. So it has a kitchen, it has a bathroom, it's two or three bedrooms and a living room, and has furniture and all those kinds of things that uh, just make observing really nice. It's fairly cheap. It has a terrible name, just an awful name. I really don't know what this guy was thinking. It's called Breaking Wind uh, Lodge. <laughs> Wes gets it. He's laughing. At, <laughs> laughing. <laughs> um, it is right next to a sheep farm, and it's also right next to a string of trees that are used as a windbreak. So maybe somebody sometimes said, oh, we'll just call this Breaking Wind Lodge <laughs> because it's got this windbreak of trees along the way. Um, I have not stayed there myself. I know Mark just loves it. He just loves it. And he goes up there fairly often. So if you see his notice on the forum, uh, 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 you know, you'd have good company and he'll help you find it. And, uh, and you could have a good time. It's, you have to set up in the, there's kind of a flat parking area covered by gravel. And that's where you set up. There is not really a front yard. The whole thing is, is located so that it's not really approachable from the front. You approach it from the back, you drive in and you park in the back and you set up in the back. So that means that when you set up, you're kind of got car, telescope, car, telescope, car, telescope. There's kind of a, a mixing of cars and telescope and, uh, and it's all very close to each other. And the, the bathroom, of course, is just going to be a few yards away, but um, uh, I don't know. I, I personally don't like to have them so close together. I'm always afraid somebody is going to want to drive out in the morning and they're going to knock my scope over or something like that. You can tell for me, uh, the whole bathroom situation is always just completely important. I always need to know. It's the first thing I need to know is where's the bathroom going to be and how far is it away from my telescope? Okay. And then there's a place called Pine Mountain Observatory, which is um, east of Eugene. It's run by the Eugene Physics Department. And there is a campground across the way from there. It's a kind of a gravel road. You go up to Pine Mountain. There's like this 10 unit campground that has no running water and no electricity and a pit toilet. 
and it is fabulous. I love going up there. You can't set up in the campground. You have to get permission from the people at Pine Mountain Observatory to set up uh, where they are. They have told us that Rose City Astronomer members, if they contact them in advance and ask permission, um, because there are times they have public events up there or used to before COVID shut everything down. They have kind of a flat concrete area, um, but you have to then go back down the hill to use the uh, pit toilet and come back up again <laughs> to use the flat concrete area for observing. Um, the thing that I have found that is making it hard to use now is that um, somehow it got on the internet as a wonderful place that if you walk up behind the hill up there and kind of look out over, I guess, the whole of Southern Oregon or Eastern Oregon, it's a great place to take your cell phone to take a picture of the Milky Way or the moon or something coming up. So there was this last time I went, it was the 4th of July, there's all these um, people coming up with their cell phones to take pictures and then the, to get back down because it was night they used that bright 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 flashlight on the end of their telescope to walk down the hill again and flashed it all over our observing site so they didn't used to come up there until doing this got on some social media or some something on the internet and now as far as i'm concerned they, they've kind of ruined it um because I spend all my time being mad at all these people going up there. <laughs> hey, Margaret, are we ever going to go back to Maupin? Um, I do not know. Maupin um, is a big cow field. We call it Maupin, but what it is, it's a private farm um, outside of Airport. Yes. Maupin. And uh, the man who owns it, um, is the fire chief for that district. And this is grassland. And so every year when we want to go up there, he's busy fighting fires. And we want to go up there smack in the middle of fire season. So we're in the position of actually putting him and his property in danger. So if anybody smokes or runs a generator or, or you know, we could set a fire ourselves. We could also find ourselves in a fire situation very quickly up there. So we've kind of lost touch with him. It's like every time we want to talk to him, he's he's off fighting fires. And so one year I tried to talk to him in March before the fire season began, and he was busy preparing for fire season and didn't really have time to talk to me. So um, I don't know if anybody still goes up there. I've always been, I, I love it up there. I think, I think it's a wonderful place to observe. There's, you know, 360 degree horizon, it's flat. You've got the beautiful mountain in the distance. It's, you know, the, the only thing that I worry about it is that if you're going up there for the first time, it's very easy to get yourself to, turned around and confused and lost. And I always dread sending a new person up there. And what I would rather do is if you want to go up to this place called Maupin, go up with somebody who's already been there before and just, uh, what do you call that? Where you go together? Caravan, oh, yeah. caravan up there together. Um, Cause at least for the first time, I just would not want to send you up there without somebody to show you where it is. Yeah. Plus, yep. in the past, though, it's always been an organized star party. I don't think he's really fond of. No, you can't just show yeah. up on your own. No, we've yeah. always been an organized star party. And there was always an issue about members driving across the ditch. Uh, and the ditch is important because ditches are um, water management tools. And they're not just there because somebody wanted to dig a ditch. They're actually an important way to keep your field from getting turning marshy and mosquitoey mosquitoes are a serious problem at Maupin. serious serious problem at Maupin. and um uh so he doesn't want people to drive across the ditch and damage it he wants us to go all the way down the road and turn and go in the little bridge area 
And um, sometimes people don't, they damage the ditch. And so that's been an issue. So we made some signs that said, keep going, keep going, keep mm -hmm. going, turn here. <laughs> and he's got those signs. Um, and we're trying to develop Malheur Field Station. Uh, I know Jeff, you're coming up next and I'm trying to go real fast so I can, I can get this to you. Um, uh, Malheur Field Station, I th think has a lot going for it. it. Its counterpart is Camp Hancock and Camp Hancock is owned by OMSI. And we love going there. We love going to Camp Hancock. And we have traditionally had a springtime star party and a fall star party, but we always had to work around the kids because Camp Hancock is a place where kids come in the summertime, bus loads of them come every week, a new bus load of kids. And so we had to schedule our stuff in March and either September and October. Not the best weather period. A lot of times we got kind of clouded out or it would be really cold, but we love the facilities. It's very lodgy and piney and lots of uh, beautiful places to take pictures and go hiking and etc. Um, we're not going this year, partly because OMSI had to close it and partly because OMSI is tearing out all of its bathrooms and redoing them. These are cabins without, a, without water and um, they do have electricity. There's a big cafeteria, a big uh, eating area. Uh, the, the price uh, uh, includes meals. Now here field station, I wrote a long description of that in the part of the forum called where can I go observing? If you find a place to go observing and you like it, I'd like you to write it up in that section of the forum. And each place should have its own thread. So if you find two places, make each one of them an individual conversation. And in terms of driving instructions, I always start the measurement from downtown OMSI. I go to Google Maps and I you know, type uh, Malheur Field Station as my destination and OMSI as my beginning. So that way, every, every driving instruction is going to start from the same place and they'll be more comparable. If somebody says, well, I left Beaverton and it took me five hours to get there, that means less to me than if, if they all start from the same place. So I have to stop now because Jeff is going to do a, co a conversation about how you can avoid all of this by doing your observing in your backyard. <laughs> I will say I've been to Mal here in French Berlin quite a few times. It's like the darkest place I've ever been. It's a bordel one. It's a yeah. bordel one. It is just astonishing. If you've never been to a place where the star, there's a place fairly close called Malvoy Desert. Yes. And if you've never been there, the stars literally come out of the ground. Mm -hmm. It is amazing. Yeah, I was at Malheur Field Station in March and I looked up at the sky and they look three, the stars look 3D. Yeah. The sky just looked 3D. It was just unbelievable. And it was so damn cold. I could only <laughs> observe until about 11 o'clock and then I had to quit. It was just too cold. Yeah, it's, so, it's a place in Oregon where you can see native wild Appaloosas. They have pronghorn, they have bighorn sheep in the area. It's an amazing place. Yeah. So again, everything is going to be a balance. You know, how much cold can you tolerate? Can you stand yeah. to go to the bathroom in a in a less than premier porta potty? Can you walk across sagebrush without tripping? Are you afraid, afraid of coyotes? Of oh, by the way, I got stung at uh, Skyview Acres by a wasp. One year they were they just had this wasp inundation and uh <laughs> but i can tell you margaret we have more coyotes where i live here between lake oswego and portland than i've ever seen out in the wild oh really oh yeah. well i never see them in the wild i just hear them uh, <laughs> anyway margaret was right it is getting uh yeah it's time for it this is jeff and he's going to talk about eaa which is electronically assisted astronomy uh, which you can do from your backyard. I'm going to try to get a PowerPoint to run here. So let's uh, do this. Uh, anybody seeing the PowerPoint? Yes. Uh, 
Okay, I'm going to start it. Okay, so about three years ago, I hadn't used any of my equipment for about two years because I've lived in Gresham. I now live over by Tryon Creek State Park. And in the last 15 years, Portland's light pollution has really become uh, just something that stops me. And at 71, I don't like to drive back from Stubb at two or three in the morning. So after going up one day and watching my brother's dog in Cascade Locks, I took some 20 by 80 binoculars with me. I kind of really wanted to get back into viewing. So I went on cloudy nights and I found this forum that was called Electronically Assisted Astronomy. And there are a couple different ways that people use this. And the number one way that I use it, in fact, the only way I use it, is I use it at home uh, as an eyepiece replacement because I've lived in the same place now for 15 years. I've seen everything I can see with my C8 or my ES-102 or my C5. And I wanted to see more, but I didn't want to drive. The great thing about this is if you have almost any kind of go-to mount and any kind of scope on that go-to mount, you can set up, and we'll talk about that uh, later, an electric, electronically assisted uh, astronomy. Now, some people do what I call quick astrophotography, which I have absolutely no interest in. One of my setups can, can do AP, but when I'm out there, I kind of like to see as many things as I can. I'm on my, I've done 1,400 of the Herschels. Uh, uh, part of those were on scopes in South America. Part of them were on scopes here. But it's something that I really want to finish is all 2,500. And I'm finding out from my house using EAA, I can actually, even on a five-inch scope, see most of the Herschel objects. That's impressive. And uh, outreach, if you're interested in doing outreach, there are a lot of people, especially on cloudy nights on their EAA forum, to talk about how to set up and do that. But today we're going to discuss using it as an eyepiece enhancement replacement. If you live in a place where light pollution makes visual observing either not satisfactory or you just can't, don't do it because it's just not rewarding. So I've posted this in the, this uh, PowerPoint as a PDF in the EAA forum. So you can download it and get these links because the EAA forum on cloudy nights is just an encyclopedia on how to really set up and get going. And I'm not going into a lot of technical stuff. I'm just trying to give you an overview tonight. And then the two main pieces of software that people are using that do EAA is Sharp Cap, which comes in two flavors. One is a free version and the other is a pro version that costs about 10 bucks a year and does everything you've ever dreamed of. And the other software that I know of is since I have ZWO cameras, they provide a free software suite that does things easier than Sharp, Cast, uh, Sharp Cap, less technical. So for the person just starting out, that might be the best choice if you have a ZWO camera. However, if you have a DSLR, a mirrorless camera, or are you gonna buy a camera? Sharp Cap handles almost every camera in the world. And for DSLRs and mirrorless, you'll need to be able to tether your camera with something like the Backyard series of software, or some cameras come with free tethering. That means that you can hook your camera up to a computer and download images. So the basic requirements, if you want to do EAA, is a go-to mount. You can do it with other mounts, but it's a bit of a brutal effort. Uh, a telescope of some kind, and I mean any kind. It can be big, it can be small. And generally, when you're using a camera doing EAA and something like SharpCap is what I use, you'll find that in the Portland light pollution, 
you will be seeing things like you can see at a dark site with a telescope three size bigger than what you're using. Uh, then you need a camera, of course. And like I just said, if you've got a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, or if you're going to buy a, a dedicated astro camera, you can get started. If you already own the mirrorless or DSLR camera, it stops you from spending anywhere from 250 up through the roof. <laughs> a, uh, the uh, 250 camera that I use is called a ZWO224. It's a small chip. It's like a mega chip. And I use it with an old Mead uh, focal reducer, 3.3, so it's very fast. My bigger uh, ZWO camera is the 294. Mark uses the 294. It's just kind of an all-around really good camera. It uses a micro four-thirds size chip. And then a device to capture the Im images. What I mean by that, some people use uh, iPads. Some people use even phones. I tend to use a laptop. Now, I'll get, as I talk more later about the software, I'll go into why I chose the laptop route. One reason is I can run Windows Pro uh, 10 on my laptop and on my desktop. When it's cold outside, I just send my pictures to my 50-inch TV, which I'm using to give you guys this demo right now. I'm nice and warm and can view as long as I want. So anybody have a question at any time? Unmute yourself and, and, and jump in. OK, your mount, it can be either AZ or EQ. It doesn't matter because uh, the two software suites I talk about, they will uh, derotate if you're using an AZ mount, which means um, you can stack many, many images. Uh, EAA for visual, I tend to stack between one and five minutes. And I, I've got a, some pictures I'm going to show you. After about 15 seconds, you're going to see something pretty much like you'd see in a scope of a dark site. And it only gets better after that. Um, but I've, I used a Celestron SLT mount that I gave to somebody in the club for a year with my C5 before I bought an SE mount for the C6, C8, just because I could and it would be a little bit better. And like I said, if you want to use an EQ, you can. Um, but the software will take care of alignment on AZ mounts. That used to be the big reason uh, you didn't use AZ uh, for AP because of the rotation. But SharpCap takes care of that. And the other thing is just like with anything, you want to make sure that you have a mount that's somewhat reasonable for the size scopes you're using. OK. <clears throat> the reason I keep saying you don't need a big scope it's because some, you know, many members in our club have 10 inches or larger scopes. I don't have a big scope. I have an 8-inch SCT, I have a 4-inch APO, and I have my C5. Why? Because I've kind of downsized because although I'm pretty fit for somebody 71, I know at 75 or 76, life changes quick when you get old. So uh, also, most people don't start out with a 10-inch scope. So I want to make sure that you know that EAA, as long as you have the proper mount for almost any scope, you've got a chance to see things you wouldn't dream of here in the Portland area. And like I say, is um, the guy that wrote Shark Cap is way beyond me when it talks about why short exposures can work as well as long exposures if you have the right software. But he claims that doing five and 10 second exposures and doing some dark frames at the end will give you incredible images. Well, because I just want it as an eyepiece replacement, I never strive for the incredible. I just want to see things. Uh, we talked a little bit about cameras. Most people have some kind of camera. So if you've got a camera that, like I said, you can tether to your laptop if that's what you're using, you can use any camera. They taught, when you go to Cloudy Nights, the EAA forum, they will talk forever about the differences between cameras. Me, I went with the most popular cameras. I went with it because I know Mark pretty well. And he bought a ZWO and was real happy with it. He's real picky. So I went with it. The benefit of going there 
is you can start out with their software suite. It's free. It works really well. And it's, it's not quite the uh, PhD that, that uh, SharpCap can require. Can I Dedicate, ask a question? You sure can. Yes, uh, just a little, I'm trying to understand how this differs from normal astrophotography. And it sounds like it differs in that you don't do the processing at home. You, you're, you're, you want it tethered. So as you're watching it, it's, it's forming, it, stacking and all that stuff. Is that basically is that it's live? Yes, you're live viewing. Okay, thank you. And that's, and that's why uh, it works so well is that the cameras cut through the white pollution. So within, like I say, a minute, you'll see some minute images here. You're seeing something that if you're using an eight, uh, an eight inch scope, you, you would be seeing on a 14 to a 20 inch scope at a dark site. Um, I already talked about the software. Just realize that it does take a little time to get used to the software. So your first night or two out, plan on getting uh, the software under control. And I do, like I say, the ASI, ASI Studio from ZWO is somewhat easier to use than Sharp Cap when you're starting out. Okay, so this is, that's a cooler on that. Uh, that cooler is wrapped around one of my Astro cameras, but that's my C5 on the uh, SE mount head. It's a very small scope, very small scope, but I've always loved C5s. This is the second one I've had. You'd have to cut my arm off to get this one. My bigger system can, uh, consists of the uh, ES-102 uh, refractor and the C8, and that's an AZ-EQ uh, mount from Orion. And I've hooked it up with SkySense and GPS. All I have to do is turn it on, and it basically winds itself, ready to go. And, but, you know, again, I don't know how many people have setups like this, and that's why I'm going to focus more on the smaller setups. And to be honest, I generally only use one scope at a time because of the way I plan. And so my, <clears throat> my setup can basically consists of an SCT, a refractor, uh, two SCTs, and then reducers for all three cameras. This is an example of two different scopes. And I hope it's sharp on your screen. I don't know what, what <clears throat> zoom is doing to it. The one on the left is uh, done with the uh, C8 at 302 seconds using the F6.3 uh, focal reducer, which makes that scope about an F6.3. Uh, F and um, the one on the right is done with the refractor, but the difference is, is the one on the right, that's about 1 20th of the whole frame. I just am trying to show you kind of, uh, the one on the left is done with the one megapixel, the one on the right is done with the 10 megapixel camera. So you, you get the same scale with bigger uh, sensor cameras when you're looking at it, but the smaller uh, sensor cameras will work. And in, in programs, like sharp cap, you can view 100% of the the, uh, the sensor size, or you can uh, go down to 10% to manage your focus. And it has where you can focus with a with a mask if you want. But they're all similar, and this pops up like the one on the right. That was that was one minute. You're seeing color in M13 uh, works really well. Very quick. Now this is from the C5. This is M56, and this was shot at f6.3, which makes that about a 750 millimeter scope. So if you have some kind of scope that's 700 millimeters, this is kind of the scale you will see. Okay, this is a minute and 18 seconds. You're seeing some color, and when you, if you were to look through this at an eyepiece with a, a C5 here in Portland. You might see what we what we call a, a shoe polish version of this globular cluster. Um, the uh, little red marks, if you're seeing any little red marks, those are hot, hot pixels. I don't use dark frames because again, as soon as it gets to a point 
where it's something like I've seen in my eight inch, like mopping, that's enough for me. But I'm never hunting the, these kind of things. I'm always hunting kind of dimmer things. But the fact that you can see something like this in a minute on a screen. So if you're seeing by yourself or maybe if you have children or maybe your spouse likes astronomy, it pops up and you're going, wow, look at it and you move on. Uh, Jeff, can I ask you? Sure. Um, and if you go back to the previous slide, if you sat on that for longer than 78 seconds, uh, <laughs> yeah. like for 302 seconds, would it, uh, it improve over oh, time? Absolutely. And just remember, okay, so we shot this, let's just call it a minute, to make the math easy. So your next improvement comes at two, two full minutes, and then four minutes, and then eight minutes, and then 16 oh, minutes, and then you got to go 32 minutes, and then you got to go 64 minutes to see a major improvement. Yeah, no, no, but, but I just thought it might. Uh, I yes, mean, it gets better with each exposure that you add to the stack. Yeah, okay. And so, if you're using an EQ or even with sh sharp caps, sometimes won't allow you to go longer than about 20 minutes because the rotation gets too much to handle. But if you're using a U uh, an EQ and you have it or you're guiding it or, you're, or you've got a good one, you can do this for an hour and you'll get an AP kind of image. That's the difference is if you're willing to take the time and the light pollution, you can get AP images. When I go out, I use sky tools and I normally drive 15 to 20 objects I want to see. And normally I've put the scope that I want to use for those type of objects. I used the refractor for nebulous. I use the SCT for uh, smaller galaxies. And my, S, my, my C5 is my grab and go EAA scope because I can just carry it out the door. So this is NGC 5906. Okay, this was about a five to six minute exposure. And that's a satellite, by the way, coming through there. This is a magnitude 11, but grab the surface brightness because as we all know, when you're looking at, at uh, galaxies, and this is, with, this is with the small camera. This is with a $250 camera. And it captured on a C5 in Portland, Oregon, uh, a 22.5 magnitude surface brightness. And um, that's pretty amazing if you ask yes, me. Yes, it is. And again, if I would, if I've also, I, uh, in sharp cap and in ASI, you can change the contrast and that kind of stuff. I've got this bumped way up because I found that what I'm looking uh, and I'm not wanting to make a pretty picture. If I use a little, uh, a little more gain, you know, you get a little modeling there, but uh, you can see more extension. I mean, we're looking at a lot of extension on that galaxy for such a small system. And this is, what is Portland? 5.5 Bartle scale? I think 5.5. It's, uh, and I might be a little darker because I live on an acre and I'm surrounded by giant trees. I only have a 75 degree view of the sky. But I think I might be at, at Bortle 6. But anyway, so this is just a one megapixel or, uh, camera. And it produces these kind of things. It's also, this camera is exceptionally good on, planet, on planets, if you like planets. OK, here's another galaxy. NGC 6503. These are very obscure little galaxies. I mean, these are none of your, your Messier showpieces. <laughs> uh, but again, take a look across there on the C5, which is a small scope. You know, four or five inches is, a, is not a very big scope. And a lot of people, they'll start out with four or five inch scopes. And you can put that on, a, on an SE mount that costs $450. I paid $200 used for the, for the C5, $450 for a brand new uh, Celestron SE mount for the C6, C8. And so, uh, and I had other cameras, you know, I had everything but a laptop that I could hook up to this. If you got a, a camera of any type and a laptop, you can get into this fairly cheap if you don't have a go-to mount. 
But again, it goes all the way across the scene. And like I said, I think this was about a, because this is a very dim galaxy for the C5 in this light pollution, I think this was like three to five minutes. But take a look, you get round stars. This is probably, I believe this was at 15 seconds. This was probably 30 images stat. So you see, you're getting pretty good round stars in it. So if you're really picky, which I'm not, because remember, I'm trying to mimic an eyepiece here. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the uh, galaxy center there, the, the nucleus of the galaxy, it's yeah. a little wider. Yeah. Um, that's pretty amazing for a five inch telescope in the middle of Portland. And notice you're actually getting some color in that galaxy. <clears throat> and you can, if you look at the left where you can see the sharp cap, you're gonna get some crop there. You see the black areas? Because that's it automatically adjusting the image so you don't have to. Oh, anybody know what this is? <laughs> <laughs> it's a Marlboro smoke ring. No, it's, it, yes, it, it is the ring nebula. This was three minutes on the C5 in Portland. So it tends, this little, uh, the little camera tends to do exceptionally well on these, on, you know, nebula like this. Anything that's bright, because it's, it's going to be big in the, and if you're using an SCT, even if it's focal reduced, you're still, you know, this is probably 700 millimeter. But that's a pretty good shot for a three minute exposure in downtown. Well, I'm not really downtown. I'm out by Tryon Creek State Park. So that's a pretty good shot, I think. Considering that I'm just trying to match what I would, you know, in the eyepiece here in Portland, it's nothing but a tiny gray ghost with maybe a, uh, when you go way up high on your magnification, you can see some of the ring structure with a bigger scope. Um, that red streak up there is another kind of satellite. I, I have yet to get the, the Skylink satellites come across my sky because I've only got 75 degrees, but I'm sure they're lurking. Okay, so we're going to look at it. Two, satellite, two galaxies in Leo. Everybody's probably seen these. Um, so this was a six minute exposure with the C8 at F6.3. If you have an SCT, but I would definitely, with, with any kind of camera you're using outside of the small 224, get the, the 6.3 reducer flattener. It's worth the, uh, you can buy them used on cloud, cloudy nights, uh, for their, their sales for them for a hundred bucks or you can pay 150 and get a new one. Again, this is greater than what I see in the IPS. What I see in, see in the IPS in my C8 here is just about the center of the galaxy and maybe the brightness area around it. Um, so if you've never seen a galaxy before, and you've got an EA system and you go chasing the SEAs, you're going to going to see some good stuff really quick. I found that my wife, who isn't a, an astronomy aficionado, when she comes in and sees something live stacking, she goes, that's pretty cool. OK, 66. You can see that this, you can see the, the clap. <clears throat> Maybe you can see my cursor. But you can see that it's really showing you some of the, the, the cloud areas in this. Shows you that the core of the galaxy uh, the 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 uh, matter around it is not symmetrical. Um, this was with the low camera again. This is with the two hundred and fifty dollar camera. I know it sounds like I'm hyping low cost stuff, but I really think that most people that get into astronomy don't have. You know, I'm going to be honest. I paid that other setup is about a six thousand dollar setup. This is, you know, that's a that's a uh, I bought the C8 in the year 2000. It's a 21 year old telescope that you can pick up for 400 bucks on cloudy nights uh, by itself. And notice again, this is a pretty good, pretty good star focus. When you consider all I do is get a, a pro, I don't use a, I've got mask and all that other stuff, but I just kind of blow up the star to 100% and get it as sharp as I can get it and run with it. Again, 
um, just like the last exposure, this was probably in the four or five minutes, which for me is a really long exposure. But this just kept building and building and building with the, you know, with the additional stacks. And you, you get to see, I mean, I can't imagine seeing this stuff in the city with anything but like a 16 or maybe a 24 inch scope. Okay. Can anybody see the actual subject of this picture? You're muted, Margaret. Margaret, you're muted. There you go. Now you can talk. I just clicked you on again. Uh, so as I was saying, this little camera, if you're doing uh, nebula like this, uh, man, it's, it's a killer. Again, look at the stars. You know, yeah, the edges, they're a little wonky. And I can see that this is not great focus because this little tiny stars showing something that shouldn't be showing there. But I always, I use plate solving, by the way, which is another piece of software that's way too involved to talk about here. Normally, it's my go-tos are always on whatever camera I'm using. But this tool called plate solving, which is free, by the way, software, places your object right in the center of whatever camera you're using. This, by the way, uh, the blue snowball in Andromeda. I'm sure most people have seen it once or twice, but have you ever seen it that blue and this size? So yeah. it, and that's from you know Portland, Oregon, with the 5.5 uh, boreal skies. Okay, so I'm, I've got two more slides. No, I'll be done. Sorry, I'm running over. This is a nebula that. <clears throat> With, with my refractor. And this is with the 294. If you can look at the size of this, this is a, there's a lot of stars in this image because it's a much larger sensor. You see, you see how this looks a little wonky for a star? That's because there's a nebula around this star. Now, I have a filter that I could also use in Portland. I just got it. It was outrageously expensive, but it will take what you see here, and you see this kind of darker area right in here? That's all nebula. It's just not showing up right now. And you'll be able to see that instead of, instead of a, a two minute exposure like this was, I'll probably have to do a five to six minute exposure because filters, nebula filters, uh, especially the, the newer ones require a little more uh, stuff. But anyway, that's what you can do with a four inch scope uh, with a, a micro four thirds size sensor. Can you guys see where, what's by my cursor? I don't know. Can you see that? Yes, yeah. your cursor. Okay. Uh, uh, you just see the cursor? No. Can other people see the cursor? Oh, okay. So look in the center, and in and I believe that you can. I believe that you can blow up the center in your zoom. Do you know how to do that, Margaret? Uh, uh, no, because we're screen sharing, so it's your screen. Okay. So nobody else has access to it. But I can see, I can see that nebula right in the middle. That's that a galaxy. galaxy. Yep. Yeah, that galaxy. Okay. So, you know, one of the things about APOs, they, they're very, very sharp animals. And that was, I really got, got it because I've never had one because I could. And I've set it up now where it's just going to be uh, an emission nebula scope because I, I, I'm not able to get those massive T's without, um, they're mostly too big. But this is this galaxy, anybody ever heard of 6496 the fireworks galaxy? Yes, I've recommended it to people. Okay, well, I mean, you can see that uh, in, just about six minutes from downtown Portland, this is what you get. I think that's pretty impressive. I think that that's worth every penny I paid for everything to be able to do that from my yard and uh, in six minutes. That The longest I've ever gone is 10 minutes and that was trying to do a nebula when I didn't have a nebula filter and it was very frustrating. But anyway, any, any questions? Open up your mics and let your hearts pour out. 
So I, I had a question. So sure. um, I, I unfortunately live in a condo in South Waterfront and I can see uh, Jupiter and Saturn. <clears throat> um, you know, I mean, this is intriguing. Do you think it would work or is it? it would absolutely. The camera doesn't see the modification. Sorry, can you say that again? It, absolutely. There are people in New York City that use this. Oh, okay. And, you know, one of the things, of course, Margaret will hate me for saying this. I really like to see the club take one of their go-to scopes and make it into a new AA scope that can be checked out from the library so people could test this out. Because I think the, one of the biggest things is people get so disappointed. Like if you live downtown Portland or if you live where there's some kind of other light pollution like a stadium or a, a shopping center, you know, you spend all this money buying your equipment and it just, it doesn't give you what you want. Whereas I can tell, like I said, I quit for two years. And as soon as I saw this, I decided to make, uh, I mean, the only thing I had really at, at that time was the SLT mount and an ST80 that I wasn't using. And I had my C8 and an LXD uh, 75 that I also gave away to a club member. And the first night of doing this, it was magic. And I think that Margaret could all probably be talked into having Mark and I maybe even help develop a, a course, like there's a course for AP. Maybe we could do an EAA course if there's enough people interested. Right? Yeah, because you know, Jeff, we're in the process of re, uh, reassessing our telescope library. Um, and I uh, am interested in the last six months of my um, of my service is um, building different segments of the telescope library. We have mm -hmm. a pretty good binocular section. I would like to see more astrophotography equipment. And and the last time we had a meeting, I suggested that we begin to build up EAA equipment. Uh, so yes, I think it's a good idea, and uh, I, I think it would make our library more useful to members who need to get their hands on certain kinds of equipment and use them for a while before they decide whether they like this or not and whether they're going to carry forward with it. Yeah. Because it certainly, like I said, it made it, I wouldn't be doing astronomy right now if it wasn't yeah. for this. And, you know, I might have jumped in a, a bit more than I should have, except I can tell you, it's done two things for me. It's really kindled my thirst to finish the rehearsals, and it also has made me less uh, anxious about getting out every clear night. Because you know what? If you go out one night and the next night is clear also, I can do 20 or 30 things in a night where I'm satisfied. I mean, I've hit my goals. Yeah. You know? And um, like I say is my C5 on an SE mount and I've got a lithium battery on it. I can pick the whole thing up, excuse me, carry it out, take my laptop out, hook it up on a small table and be up and running in minutes. And if you've got more than one computer, you can set it up on, a, on the, uh, what they call re, uh, remote desktop and run it inside when your scope's happy outside if you're not. It just, for me, it's just the perfect thing. And I have no interest in making beautiful pictures. I just want to see things. Yeah. And this has opened up. It's like I've got a 24, uh, uh, a 15, and a 12-inch scope if I was out at a dark site seeing this stuff. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of an evangelist. But anyway, I just, yeah. th thank you for coming. So I'm wait glad. a minute, Jeff, there's one okay. more question. Okay. Uh, somebody asked, how long does your laptop battery last? And do okay. you use external power for the laptop as well as the go-to mount? Actually, uh, I use, I, I do both. I have two batteries that last about two and a half hours each. And I got to do is reboot, reboot your laptop. When it dies, it doesn't screw up your camera or, or the mount. You just reboot it and open your programs again and you're up and running. But I am in my, for the, the, the bigger outfit, I do run AC because that mount for some reason is a monster eating electricity. 
and it's got real voltage sensitivity to it. So if you drop below, uh, if you drop below like 11.8 volts, it, it starts screaming. Literally, they have a warning but a sound in it that screams at you. So I'm, I'm now using voltage stabilized 12 volts to do it in the laptop when I'm, at, when I'm using that scope. I use the batteries when I'm using the SE because, you know, when I'm using the, the five inch out in front, I tend to do maybe two hours, you know, whereas with the other scope, I can do three or four hours and still want to do more. Okay, well, it's now I have a question. Oh, sure. okay, sorry. That's all right. My name's Rick. I'm getting sort of new at this. I just want to understand this. As you were getting these pictures in from your telescope, it's actually, you've, you've started a stacking session. Is that what happens? And then the software yes. um, just continues to stack whatever comes in? Yep. Okay. Uh, it, uh, that's, the technical term for that is live stacking. But uh -huh. you can also take single images. Like, right. You know, a lot of people they get as much in 10 seconds or 15 seconds. And then yeah. uh, you have your option of saving JPEGs, PNGs, or TIFF files. Right. Uh, guys like Mark, who, you know, he's running a 16 inch go-to DOP and he takes one and two second images out of that. And there may be three or 400 images or 500 images he stacks. But right. a lot, but you can do single images or stacking and yeah. there's all sorts of color correction tools <laughs> built in the sharp cap and all that stuff. And yeah, you well, I, go that far. I bought a, a camera that's a, essentially, it's supposed to be an astro astronomy camera. It's a Canon uh, RA. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, it does some nice things. It's that, you know, when you, you can look at the, you can flip the screen out on the camera. And so you can be watching through your telescope and focusing on this little screen out in the field. Um, and I'm just to the point where I'm going to start taking multiple images. And I was intrigued that you could have, you know, somebody there with a catcher's mitt. They're just stacking the balls as they come in. You know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And well, with your your Canon, you can get a tether a tethering software if you have a laptop, and you can use SharpCap with your Canon because right, well, like like backyard Canon. Yeah, I'm actually using the Canon software right now uh, with Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little slower, of course, than having a direct connection. But um, if you have, I believe, if you have enough space between uh, starting the exposures and stopping, you know, from yes. how many seconds, that in close proximity, the, the Wi-Fi works pretty well with the laptop. Um, and you can see them right there. And you can actually make the changes to the exposures right on the laptop. Yep, absolutely. SharpCap has all sorts of tools for doing that. Yeah, I'll have so, to look into that too. Yeah. Okay. All right, they guys. do have a free, views, a free version you can check. Okay, out. I, I got to do a couple yep. things. One, I have to thank you, Jeff, because I'm getting all kinds of thank you, very interesting, very informative, thank for the great uh, talk, et cetera, from uh, your listeners. And we have to find out how people can contact you if they have more questions about this. Okay. You, you, you send the, the, new, uh, the, the new drone on Mars a message and then it'll relay it back. <laughs> so uh, uh, can I, I put your email address here in the chat and anybody who wants to contact you can pick it up? Yeah, but I, I tell you, it's prob that's okay. You can do that. Also, visit the EAA forum on RCA because- Okay, yeah, he's on the forum. Yeah, but you know, uh, Jeff, I have to advise you. Only about forty percent of our members are on the forum. Okay, but yeah, uh, you know, I, I'd be more than happy to you know try so to answer. What is questions. your email address? Oh, you want my email? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, I'm going to give you. Uh, um, do this one: sales s a l e s at marketmagic.com. Market. M-A-R-K-E-T-M-A-G-I-C -E dot com. That's an old okay. business one I still have tied into my website, so I'll get to you. Okay, so there you are, everybody. I just put it in chat so you can copy it or save it or memorize it or whatever. And again, I put this, I, I put this in a PDF on the EAA forum in RCA. So if you're a member of the forum, you can actually download the 
presentation if you want. Okay, okay. All right, well, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jeff. It's really been informative. Thank you, everybody. For and, uh, everybody you. seems to have liked it. So I'm going to give you a thumbs up because I've already clapped for you. <laughs> and thank you, thank you. I'm going to shut this down. Okay. Thanks night, for coming, everybody. everybody. Thank you. Yeah, take care. Bye. Bye. And a meeting for all. <laughs>